So we're beginning a, a new series that's going to be going over uh, three weeks called Milk and Honey. Uh, we're going to explain what that means in just a moment if you don't already know the reference into the Old Testament. But in a couple weeks from now, I have the honor of turning 45. And, uh, and so once... Uh, once uh, if you think I said 35, great. Uh, no, I did not. But when, when my age number uh, started beginning with a four instead of a three, uh, someone who loves me very much was like, hey, dummy, are you going to ever go back to the doctor? And I was like, thank you for the encouragement, wife. Uh, and so, so every year afterwards, I, right around my birthday, I get a whole blood panel drawn, and we go, oh, I go over it with my doctor, uh, and <laughs> don't laugh at me, Josh. Uh, and uh, usually we're in a restaurant. Uh, one time he was taking my blood pressure in the restaurant, and a woman looked over, and, and she's like, what are you doing? He's like, I'm a doctor. I'm taking his blood pressure. She goes, oh, I'm a nurse. He goes, oh, do you want to do it? I actually don't know what I'm doing, because I'm a doctor, and nurses do this <laughs> that's pretty much. I, I, I think that's a little bit what you said. I think you were like, "Oh, nurses actually do this." That uh, <laughs> you are a very good doctor and nurse, husband, father. Okay. Anyways, but here's the thing: I got to do it every year. I did it the last four years. I got to do it again. I'm always like, why do I got to do this again? I just did it last year. And Kelly's like, well, has there anything changed in the last year? I'm like, has anything changed in the last year? Because things tend to change in our lives, not just year to year, but sometimes month to month or week to week. And last year, right around this time, we did a financial series. And some things might have changed for you over the last year, like you may not have been a part of the church back then, or what your income is has changed, or what your outgo has changed during that time, or, or where you live, or what you drive, or what your work is, or any of those things might have changed. So just because you did something one time doesn't mean that you don't need to do it again. We want to spend our lives making sure that everything in us is under the lordship of Jesus. When I was single, to put my money under the lordship of Jesus just meant give a little bit before I went to Taco Bell. Like that's all it meant when I was, a, then I got married and then I had a kid and then that kid became a teenager, you know? And I was like, and so it, you, there's a lot of different things. I've had multiple jobs during our marriage, multiple salaries, lived in multiple houses, not at the same time. And so every time these shifts and changes in my life were important moments for me to go, wait a minute, Maybe what it looked like to put my finances under the lordship of Jesus in one season is not what it looks like in the other. And I don't want to rest on where I've been. I want to continually ask how I can put my life under the lordship of Jesus. So every year we talk for at least a, a kind of focused section, if not spread out throughout the rest of the year in addition, about money. And too often we equate money and God with one of three, I think, wrong ways to think about it. The first is we avoid the subject. Uh, people don't always like to talk about money. You ever walk up to somebody and be like, hey, what do you do? And, you, and they tell you, and you go, how much does that pay? <laughs> they, that's normally not the next thing you ask, because we don't, we don't, I'm not saying we should, but, well, you know, so people are like, I don't really like talking about money. I don't like always talking about how I use it and what everything. And, and so since we might be at a place where we go, well, we don't want to offend people. We don't want to run them off. So let's not say hard things they may not like. And unless it's your first time here, you know that that's not really exactly who we are. Uh, and so we're going to talk about the things that are most important, not the things that are the most enjoyable so that we can really and truly bring honor and glory to God. The other thing would be if we only talked about money in the context of giving, if all the, the only time that we as a church talked about money was in the context of giving, that would mean we we're just self-interested narcissists who only care about your life being used for God in as much as it actually affects us. And if that's the case, I also think that we're doing a pretty poor job. The third one is, though, the most dangerous. The third one is when it comes to Christians talking about money. I, I don't want to say the church because now we got Instagram preachers and TikTok theologians and, and everybody who wants to be able to equally share their opinion. So everybody likes to blame the church. But I think there's a lot of this is that in an effort to appease people and make the gospel more palatable, the focus of not just messages on money, but the message of the gospel overall has become the increase of your life at the behest of godly principles, as if the whole point of following God was that we used God to bless us rather than using all of who we are to love and serve and bless God. 
There's a big, I mean, like, again, somebody, that is the most dangerous message because it heavily involves God's, God and his word, but it puts the focus, elevation, and amplification on our provision and not his glory. So be careful listening to anyone, a preacher, a, a, per, a small group leader, a pastor, or any Christian, because they'll let you know who's at the center of their theology, God or man. Are we honoring God through our finances or are we trying to honor our finances with the principles of God? If your blessing, your reward are the focus and not the result of your life with Christ, if you are coming because of what you can get and not because of who he is, be careful that the offer you're accepting for the fruit you're eating does not come at the end of a forked tongue because using God to boast and bless our hard work, though, it's not a new danger. That's not a new trap that we've fallen into as a result of can't stop, won't stop, and hashtag always on the grind, and you know, like, great, <laughs> good luck. You're gonna be one of those people who are 24 and look 34 or 54, you know what I'm saying? Like, because you never break. You never take a, you never, you never rest. And you've forgotten something very important. Especially if you're a Christian, you've forgotten something very important. In the Old Testament, there's a story of maybe the greatest miraculous provision, maybe in all of scripture, maybe in all of history, not, not just in what was provided, but the length of time at which it was provided. And we're gonna read this story and then see how the people who experienced the blessing of God were in danger of forgetting that very God. In the book of Exodus, we pick up the story of the, the nation of the Jews as they have been in slavery in Egypt for about 400 years. The, uh, the, the timing, for, for some reason, God has decided now is the time to set the people free. He raises up a deliverer in Moses, and Moses uh, receives the call out of a burning bush. Uh, he's going to lead hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people, out of slavery and captivity. And he is not only told that he is going to lead them out of Egypt, he's also told where he's going to lead them into. So often we think about what we have to avoid or what we have to leave behind or what we have to not do when it comes to our faith. And what we need to know is that anytime God is calling us out of something, it means he is calling us into something else that is always going to be better for it. It may not be easier, but it is always going to be better for us. This is what God tells Moses in Exodus chapter three, verse eight. So I have come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptian, Egyptians and lead them out of Egypt into their own fertile and spacious land. It's a land flowing with milk and honey. The land where the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jezebites now live. A land flowing with milk and honey. And what that means is, of course, where do you get milk from? The store. No, just, where do you, you get them from cows. And for cows to be able to be healthy enough to have milk, that means that there's grass for them to feed, which means there's water for the grass. God is telling them, just in saying milk and honey, how lush and available resources will be in the land you're about to go into. Now, as a result, Moses goes to Egypt. He confronts Pharaoh. He says, let my people go. Pharaoh says, no. They do this 10 times. There's plagues. They escape through the Red Sea. Uh, they're all of their, uh, their all of the, the armies of Egypt are, are flooded and, and drowned in there. And, and the people of God are right about to enter into this land flowing with milk and honey. And they send some spies to check it out, do a little pre-scouting. And the people there end up taking their eyes off of God and looking at the circumstances, looking at the challenges, looking at the difficulties around them. And because of that, they get afraid. And they decide to trust rather in what they see and what they know of themselves than to trust in God alone. As a result, that whole generation passes away and they wander around in the desert for 40 years years, 40 years, until everyone who was of a responsible age had passed away and the next generation was about to go into the promised land. But to eat and to drink and to live, every day they would wake up, there would be bread. There would be manna. 
Every day they would wake up, and then at one point they got tired of bread. I don't know who these people are. I've never met any of them. Any of you anti-carb and we're only supposed to be on keto. I don't know. When God wanted to miraculously provide, what did he provide first? Bread. Mm, let's do the altar call right now. And they, yeah, just, dip it. Uh, and then they're like, well, we could use some meat. We're not hitting our protein goals. So he's like, fine, here's quail. They're like, we're thirsty. Moses hits a rock. Water comes from a rock. For 40 years, they don't farm, they don't plant, they don't harvest. Manna, quail, and water are there miraculously over and over again. And we pick up this story in the book of Deuteronomy. Deutero literally means the second telling. This is the second telling of the law. They're about to go back into the land of milk and honey. It's 40 years after and Moses is delivering the law again to them and reminding them of how they're going to live, giving them God's words, not just for where they are now, but for what might happen when they go into the land. And in Deuteronomy 8.1, it starts with be careful. Be careful to obey all the commands that God is giving you today. Then you will live and multiply. You will enter and occupy the land the Lord swore to give your ancestors. Remember how the Lord, your God, led you through the wilderness for 40 years, humbling you and testing you to prove your character and to find out whether or not you would actually obey his commands. Yes, he humbled you by letting you go hungry and then feeding you with manna, a food previously unknown to you and your ancestors. He did it to teach you that people do not live by bread alone, rather that we live out of every word that comes from the mouth of God. So even in trying to do that, he wasn't trying to teach you, look how I can provide. He is saying, look, when you come and follow me, provision will come. I mean, for 40 years, your clothes didn't wear out. Your feet didn't blister and swell. Think about it. Maybe you can think about it from last week's message if you were here. Just as a parent disciplines a child... The Lord, your God, disciplines you for your own good. If you're disciplining your child for their own good, you are trying to teach them a lesson. You are trying to change a mindset. You are trying to get them to think differently and trying to get them to think differently. Then I, I just needed the bread. No, you need the word of God. He's the one who sets us free, not just from hunger, he set you free from slavery. He set you free from oppression. He set you free from Egypt. He kept you safe in this desert. He kept you safe all this time. He's not just the God who gets your, 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 your bellies full. He's the God who resets your souls. He's the God who changes you from the inside out. You don't need bread to live, though you get to have it. You need the word of God to live. And he wants to create a dependence, not on the bread, but on the God who brings the bread. Because miracles... They're easier, they're easier to remember, but they're not staying in this land. They're not staying in the desert. He's giving them this warning because they're about to go into the land flowing with milk and honey. And God, knowing the danger, knowing the temptation, once they get into the promised land, continues his warning in verse six. So obey the commands of the Lord your God by walking in his ways and fearing him. That's where all of this starts. It does not start with you giving. It does not start with you tithing. It does not start with you serving. It doesn't, that's not where your relationship with God starts. It starts with walking in his ways and fearing him, with trusting him above all else for your life and your salvation. Now, your Lord, the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, flowing streams, Pools of water, fountains and springs that gush out into valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley, grapevines, fig trees, pomegranates, olive oil, honey. It's a land where food is plentiful and nothing is lacking. Think about where they are in the desert. In the desert, food is lacking and nothing is plentiful. And he's about to flip that entirely for them. It's a land where iron is as common as stone. Copper is as abundant of the hills. Well, what did you build with iron and copper? Bowls, utensils, and weapons. You're going to be able to defend yourselves. You're going to be able to build here. 
you're not just going to get rushed through it. You're going to be able to settle here and be here for the long term. And when all of that's happening, that's the time to be careful. Beware that in your plenty, you don't forget the Lord your God and disobey his commands, regulations, and decrees that I am giving you today. For when you have become full and prosperous and have fine homes to live in, and when your flocks and herds have become very large and your silver and gold have multiplied along with everything else, be careful. Now you might look at that and go, okay, so when you become full and prosperous and have fine homes to live in, look, you may not think that your home is fine. You might think it's fine, but it's, it's, if it's fine or if it's fine. But let me tell you something. The home that all of you live in throughout all of history and most of the world still today would be considered an incredibly fine home. I know if you live in one neighborhood, you might go, it's not Starkey Ranch. And if you're in Starkey Ranch, you might go, it's not the back of Starkey Ranch. And if you go, well, it's not the same thing as Champions Club. And it's not the same thing as the neighborhoods that don't even have it. Like, you can find a way to keep doing that to yourself instead of understanding that the home that you're in, it's pretty foreign. <laughs> Where am I? Oh yeah. <laughs> Fine home. And when your flocks and herds have become very large and your silver and gold have multiplied. Okay, so if you are not a farmer in here, this is saying well, when, when what you do for work is actually providing for you, when what you do for work is actually starts providing for you, be careful. Do not become proud at that time and forget that the Lord your God who rescued you from the slavery of Egypt, it was him. Don't forget that he led you through the great and terrifying wilderness with its poisonous snakes and scorpions where it was so hot and dry. He gave you water from a rock. He fed you with men in the wilderness. It was a food unknown to your ancestors. He did this to humble you and test you for your own good. Big verse here, 17. He did this so you would never say to yourself, I have achieved this wealth with my own strength and energy. Again, we just talked about fine houses. Let's stop on that word wealth. You might go, well, I, I couldn't retire now. I'm not wealthy. I think we use that word wealthy to either mean one of two things. I don't have to work or I, I can get anything I want. And you go, well, I, I can't do that. So I'm not wealthy. Again, in the context of the world and history, yes, you are. We are. We are. And so you might be able to dismiss that and go, well, once I get to wealthy, I'll worry about this. How about this? I have achieved all of my needs being met with my, not once, I have achieved all of my needs being met with my own strength and energy. I, when I read the scriptures, I always try to give grace to the people who are there because we're reading about them. We know what's going to come. They don't. They're just in it for the first time. We're going, how could, Peter, how could you keep denying Jesus? What's wrong with you? As if three times is the only time, amount of times we've ever denied Jesus in our life. Peter, how could you take your eyes off of Jesus? You, why are you sinking in the water? It's like, I don't think I would have gotten out of the boat. <laughs> These folks who are still alive have either wandered in the desert for 40 years and never planted and stewarded and grown, or were young, like children, in Egypt, watching either their parents or grandparents become slaves and basically just receiving whatever they had at the behest of their slave master. They are not a people who understand what it's like to plant and harvest for generations, for season after season, and actually see fruition. They've never been in a place where their effort would create the provision they needed to live. So even though it seems foolish to us, you're talking about people from a 400-year background. They, they don't know what that's like, but God does, and he knows, listen, the man is about to cease, the quails will disappear, and water will no longer pour from the rock. In fact, if we jump a little bit forward into the book of Joshua, once they're in the promised land, it says in Joshua chapter 5, when the Israelites were camped at Gilgal on the plains of Jericho, they celebrated the Passover, that's when we celebrate Easter, on the evening of the 14th day of the first month. 
The very next day, when they began to eat unleavened bread and roasted grain harvested from the land, no manna appeared on that day. No manna appeared on the day they first ate the crops of the land, and it was never seen again. So from that time on, the Israelites ate from the crops of Cana. But that does not mean that he ceased to provide for them. The danger for them, it's the same danger that we have, is that thinking that since a miraculous provision has ceased, that the provider has stopped providing. Just because a check didn't show up in the mail. Just because somebody didn't just walk by you like they're in Ocean's 12 and slipped a $50 gift card in your purse. Just because you came home and, 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 and your lawn was mowed or anything like that. You know, like, that you go, oh, that was God. But now that I know how it's happening, the provider has ceased to provide. And thus a dangerous trap is set before the Israelites. Here's the one that we also have to make sure that we avoid. Deuteronomy 8.18. Remember the Lord your God. He is the one who gives you power to be successful in order to fulfill the covenant he confirmed to your ancestors with an oath. He is the one who gives you power to be successful. He is the one who gives you power to be successful. And I assure you of this, if you forever forget the Lord your God and follow other gods, worshiping and bowing down to them, you will certainly be destroyed. Now, they were going into a land where people worshiped a whole bunch of different gods. They would worship gods of the sun, the gods of rain, the gods of harvest, gods of fertility. Now, in an agricultural society, what kind of gods are those? Gods of provision. The danger is to think, well, God, when it was water from a rock, quail on the ground, man on the trees, that was you. But now that we're in this land, I need the rain God to take over. I need the sun God to take over. I need the God of the crops to take over. Let me worship them in what they want because they're the ones who are now going to take over since you are obviously taking a back seat. But we don't worship gods of rain, right? I mean, I know we like rain. Some of you worship the God of sun. It's Florida, I know that's why you're here. God of harvest and crops. Maybe not always the God of manna, but maybe the God of mammon. Have you ever taken a promotion that got you more money but less time with your family? Have you ever moved away from a spiritual family to a place that, by the way, we don't have state taxes because you, you needed that? Did you ever take a promotion that wasn't who you were but you needed to try to prove yourself to somebody that isn't even alive to see what you're doing anymore? Did you ever leave early and come home late to provide for a family that you didn't really see that much? And not because you had to, because you wanted to? We don't worship Ra, the sun god. We don't worship Baal and Asheroth. But there is a very, very clear line to us laying down and sacrificing our lives on the altar of gods of status, wealth, riches, provision, comparison, achievement, and performance. And just because they do not have the same gods, the same names, and the same statues, does not mean that we are just as in danger of serving other gods when we forget the Lord our God. And just as the Lord has destroyed other nations in your path, you will be destroyed if you ever refuse to obey the Lord your God. Will you receive that physically in an intimate or an immediate death? Probably not. But it does not mean that there won't begin to be 
a burning emptiness inside of your spirit, a destruction of your life and joy and hope because you're trusting in something beyond yourself. When you go into a promised land and your miracle provision stops, who is the God of the daily in those moments? The danger is that we think God's in the miraculous and we're the lords and saviors of the mundane, the daily things. Our lives are not always mundane. Sometimes they're quite exciting, even though we don't want them to be. <laughs> but we think manna and quail, thank you, God. Bread that came from grain that I planted three seasons ago and harvested and tended to and got the bugs away, I did that. Not God. God. Five loaves, two fishes, and a massive basket. Thank you, Lord, for your miraculous provision. Going fishing for a living, learning the spots, getting the funding for equipment, learning how to repair the nets, learning how to run a business, understanding the tides, understanding the season. Boy, I did that, God. I was the one out there trying to fish and get nothing or fish and get a bunch of stuff. Saving me from sin and death through the cross and the resurrection. Thank you, God. Daily living, daily choices, Choosing to do the right thing, I do that. So I'll choose what's right and wrong, what's good and evil. Thank you very much, since I'm the one who's having to do all of this on my own. It's crazy how we're always responsible for our successes. And either God or the devil is always responsible for our failures. Yes, we want to be marked by the miraculous. Let me tell you something. I want us to continue to believe for the miraculous. I want us to continue to believe for miraculous healing. I want us to believe for miraculous salvations. I want the person you think is the least likely to walk in that door to send you a text message and go, how come you didn't invite me to church this morning? When are we going next time? I want that to be the case. I want us to know what the financial provisions are that you need in your life. I want to pray for that. I want to ask those questions. I want to pray and believe for those things. We have experienced that in our own life. I've told you a story before. We were one time, we were college ministers. We were about $500 short that month on bills. And then a friend called me and said, hey, would you come up and speak at our youth camp? It pays about, it pays $500. And I was like, that seems about right. I didn't understand how travel and gas worked and stuff like that. So we were still fine. And you're like, oh, that's because you're a good preacher. Not then. No, no, no. There was no reason for them to call me. I hope those, I, God loves those kids more than my preaching that time, okay? Like, that was hundreds of messages ago. That was me going like, I don't even know if it was true. Thank good I don't even have those notes. It might have been heretical. But God loves those kids more than he loves me. And he didn't just pay me so that I could preach heresy. But I'm just saying, you, yes, God moves in the miraculous. And sometimes somebody does something at the exact same time that you need it. You go, thank you, God. We were out, in, uh, years ago, we were living in Nashville for a couple weeks, and uh, we had somebody living in our house in Tallahassee to kind of take care of it, and, and a storm came through, and uh, over the front porch, uh, ripped off the soffits, uh, and they were like, oh, we're like, call the insurance agency, and they're like, oh, we'll send somebody by, and my fear with all insurance is like, the rate is going to go up, and I'm like, no, 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 don't come by, I'll fix it, I got a staple gun, like, we'll figure it out, and then they already came. By the time we got back from Nashville, and I call them like, no, 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 no. They're like, a check is in the way. I'm like, no, no, cancel the check. I can't afford the right hike. And they're like, uh, your rate's not going to go up. And I appreciate what you're saying, but we already cut the check. There's not really much we can do about it. But before we had left for Nashville, my first this spiritual mentor was moving to go overseas as a missionary. And Kelly and I, gave what at that time was the largest single gift that we had ever given. It's funny to think about, like, oh, how are we going to do this, you know? And, and I said, the words I said to her is, I said, I want this to hurt. I, wanted to, I want to know we're doing it. I love automated, we, we do our automated giving, but, but sometimes the part of that is you kind of forget that you've done that. So make sure you get that PCO email and you read that when you're <laughs> we're processing your giving. You're like, yeah, thank you. It's a good reminder. 
the check that we got from the insurance company was a 30-fold return, what we had given to my friend. God, that's amazing. You provide miraculously. And we pray and believe for all of these miraculous. And we forget that he's the God of the mundane. We forget on the day that we don't want to go to work to praise him for the fact that we have a job. You don't like to go to work every day. I don't. <laughs> you don't like to go to work every day. Who said you had to like going to work every day? But you probably want to like the fact that you can go to work every day. After I left the church in Tallahassee, I, I did marketing and public relations for a year and a half, and I didn't know what I was doing. It was okay. My boss was fantastic. I love my coworkers, and the, 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 like, I didn't take smoke breaks because I didn't smoke, though that job was leading me to give it a shot, and because that just wasn't who I was, not because the work was bad, and I would walk outside sometimes just to, like, and almost have, like, a panic attack and not sure that I could go back in. We had this phenomenal health insurance. And so when Kelly had to be in the hospital for nine weeks with her feet above her head because Caroline, we knew, was going to come early, and then Caroline was in the NICU, when that $141,000 hospital bill came, we paid 600 bucks. Now, I don't know if we were there the whole time just for that, but that's some provision. And if you're always looking to find your destiny and purpose in the physical work that you do, you might be a little frustrated and sometimes you just need to start with, God, I'm thankful that I have a job to do. I'm not gonna do it that good because I don't really like it. Well, then don't complain that you didn't get promoted. Yeah, but God, the fa favor ain't fair. You're right, it ain't fair. And favor ain't fair is what people say when they have no understanding of how hard work works. See, if you're a Christian and your coworker works this hard because they're trying to achieve, you should at least work this hard because you're trying to bring honor and glory to the God, King, creator of the universe who saved you. And then if you should be at least working hard, even though uh, Paul the apostle says, I worked harder than anybody else in 1 Corinthians 15, so maybe you're working a little harder. Now God goes, ah, there's a faithful man. There's a faithful woman. And sometimes you get a raise. And sometimes you get a promotion. Sometimes you don't. This is not a message about how to get all the things you want and all of your bills met. That's a very Western, very modern way to think about provision. You will not have all, you, you might go through many times of lack and you go, I thought my God was a God of provision. Is he only a God who provides for you financially? Is he only the God who can do that? Is he a God who can provide you any salvation? Is he a God who can provide you any hope? Is he God who can provide you a future? Is he a God who can provide you with family? Is he a God who can help you with all of these things over and over and over? Can, can you, can, is there anything that you can say that he is the God who provided? Or is it just, God, when my needs are met, then I praise you. There's too many times that when our faith is up, it's because our bank account is up. We go, how you doing? Man, how's your faith right now? Faith is good. How's your bank account? Good. How you doing right now? Oh, struggle. How's your bank account? Struggle. And it's just like, it seems like there's a direct proportionality to these two things. What if they could ever be independent? What if as sometimes our faith goes, our, our, our finances go up and down like this? What if our faith just kind of went up and down a little bit like this? I understand it having some impact. <laughs> But you go, but, you, but when you start happening, you go, no, 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 my God is a God who provides for me. I trust in him. And maybe I got to reduce my intake. My, maybe I got to reduce my outflow. Maybe I got to change the house that I'm living in. Maybe I got to do these things because God has not promised me a house of a certain size, a car of a certain age. He has not promised me a certain amount of designer jeans or different clothes. He hasn't promised you a certain amount of square foot. He has promised you that he will never leave you or forsake you, that he will be with you, that he will, be all, that he will love you, that he will set you in the family. Those are the promises that we want to be able to be standing on. What if we could be a people who don't just believe for God to meet our needs, but as we daily, daily believe for God to meet our needs, what kind of people of faith do we become in every other area of our lives? If you're waking up tomorrow morning, oh, I got a friend in uh, Arizona. He said before he, 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 like if he's in bed and he puts his feet down, he goes, today's going to be a great day. 
I was like, today's going to be a great day. You know, like, it's just one of those cheesy things. I'm like, oh, my gosh. So he's telling us about this at dinner when I was out in California. Next morning, I go out for a walk. As I'm walking back, I see him uh, coming back from his walk. And he looks at me, and he goes, today's going to be a great day. And I was like, sure it is. And then we walk in. Boom, the elevator opens immediately. And I was like, all right, I'm listening. (laughs) I mean, just little things like that. What if we could believe and be seeing God in all of the miraculous, in all the provision, in all things? What kind of people of faith would we be for every other area? When somebody then comes to us with a sickness, when somebody then comes to us with a hurt, when somebody comes to us with an addiction, when somebody's coming to us going, I don't even know if this God is real. You don't have to point just to the miraculous in your life. By the way, it's all miraculous. You can say, my God is not just the God who brings the manna. My God is the God who brings the opportunities. Because he's the God, not just the miraculous, the God of the mundane. He's the God of the daily. He's the God of the sowing. He's the God of the reaping. He's the God of the planting season, the watering season, and the harvest season. He's the God of the open house that leads to no offers. He's the God of the sales call that produced three more leads. He's the God of the charts that you have to update at the end of every shift for my medical folks. Thank you, God, for the means to produce wealth in my life. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for the materials. Thank you for the skills. Thank you for the talent. Thank you for the work ethic. Thank you for the perspective. Thank you for the connections. Thank you for what you brought me out of. God, I'm believing for what you're going to bring me into. Thank you that I get to be salt and light here every day that I work. Thank you for the miraculous and the mundane. At the close of our sermons, I like to pull back to one scripture that we've used as a highlight. Um, It's usually two or three verses, but today it's going to be a longer section. because I think it's important for us to hear the full breadth of the warning that God gives through Moses to a people about to leave miraculous and go into the mundane. Verse six, so obey the commands of the Lord your God by walking in his ways and fearing him. Always start with relationship and intimacy, not what he can give to you and what you can get for him, but because of who he is. Oh, he's a God who wants to bless. He's a God who wants to give. He's a God who wants to be able to fill up your life. Pastor Mason will get to that in a few weeks. But the relationship is based on love, not receiving. For the Lord your God is going to bring you into a good good land flowing with streams and pools of water, fountains and springs that gush out into the valleys and hills. Verse 10, when you've eaten your fill, be sure to praise the Lord your God for the good land he gave you. But that is the time to be careful. Beware that in your plenty, beware that in your needs being met, you do not forget the Lord your God and disobey his commands, regulations, and decrees I'm giving you today. For when you have become full and prosperous and built fine homes to live in, and when your flocks and herds have become very large, your silver and gold have been multiplied along with everything else, be careful. Do not become proud at that time and forget that the Lord your God, who rescued you from the slavery in the land of Egypt, don't forget him. Don't forget he led you through a great and terrifying wilderness. Poisonous snakes, scorpions were so hot and dry. He gave you water from a rock. He fed you with manna in the wilderness, which is a food unknown to your ancestors. He did this to humble you and test you for your own good. He did this so you would never say, so we would never say, I have achieved this wealth with my own strength and energy. Look what I have done. Remember the Lord your God. He is the one who gives you the power to be successful. Remember the Lord your God. He is the one who gives you the power to be successful in order to fulfill a covenant he confirmed to your ancestors with an oath. What I'm hoping is that you catch that if you are continuing to place a yoke of perfection and performance on you, What might it feel like to take that off and truly trust in him? Not just for your finances, but for the whole of your life. 
to understand what it means to trust him with your finances, you first have to trust him with the whole of your life, with your morality, your goodness, your salvation. And then from there, we don't just expect everything to just be set before us. There's this participation that we've got to do together with God. Three weeks from now, we're going to be starting on February 25th, our next round of Financial Peace University. It's normally nine weeks. We go through it in four weeks, four Sundays. It's normally $80. We're going to be only charging $40 for people to have gone through it because there is a responsibility. See, God brings us into a land, but he says, work it, farm it, feed it, seed it, water it, take care of it. You don't just go, God, here's everything, fix it. No, God is calling us to be responsible and to move together in the same way if you're going, man, I want to, but I don't know how to use my finances. I don't know how to set this. Look, a lot of us didn't get trained in how to do budgets and your taxes or setting under all, all your margins of how much you should be spending on these things. And guess what? Then we want to create an opportunity for you to do this, to learn how to do this. And if you've already been through FBU, you're like, oh, I did it. It really worked good at then. It's not working really good now. Man, I wish I could do it again. You can do it again. You don't have to pay for it again. But if you're waiting for everything to be done for you rather than to take the responsibility with the help that's being offered, you're missing what we're talking about of not waiting for God to miraculously clear the decks for you. You know, our benevolence team, I hear, I'm not on the benevolence team, so I don't, I actually don't even know who's on it. Um, so you're like, can you tell them to? I'm like, no, I couldn't. But what I know is that a lot too many times on Friday at 4.30, hey, uh, all these bills that have been due for a couple months are due in about 30 minutes. Can you help me? You know, that's the worst time to ask for help. Because what happened is pride. No, I don't want to ask. No, I don't want to ask. I'll figure it out. 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 There's no way I can figure it out. I mean, I honestly, I think that the way our benevolence policies work, no, we can't even turn it around that fast. You know, that's the worst time to ask for help when you're in a crisis. What if with Financial Peace University, what if with things like that, you could ask for help when you weren't even in crisis, you weren't even in trouble, you were just in a little bit of difficulty? What if we could start honoring and worshiping and praising God and stewarding our resources when we were maybe just in a little bit of difficulty and maybe we don't even ever see this level of crisis in our lives? Yes, we pray. Yes, we believe. But we also take responsibility to honor God rather than asking God to honor us. You can sign up on the app. It's right there on the Sunday's tab. It's the third thing down. You don't know how to work the app. You don't have the app. Ask anybody with a purple shirt, particularly Christian style, and they'll help all of you. I just, just nominated you Christian. There you go. You're great. Let's not just believe in, and honor and thank God in the miraculous. Every day, every moment, and every opportunity, let's bring in praise and honor. Would you stand with me as we close in prayer? If you don't have communion elements, you can come up and get them. Prayer ministers, if you could come forward as well. Yep, yeah, prayer ministers can come up. Yes, thank you, Kristen. Uh, I, I want to implore you, as I do so often, please do not take communion because the people around you are or because it's the end of the service. Please take communion to remember and proclaim. To remember the level of provision that God gave to set you free from sin and death. A broken body and shed blood. He didn't teach his way out of sin. He didn't lead his way out of sin. He provided. He provided. It's also a chance for us to proclaim I don't want to leave. I want to take him as a savior and leave him behind as a provider. I want to trust in him and everything. Let me pray for us. And then let's respond in communion. God, we thank you for your word. And I'm praying for all of those who have yet to believe in you with their finances because they have yet to believe in you as their God, as their savior. And maybe talking about finances was just a way to show exactly where that was. I'm praying that they would lay down a trust in themselves, a confidence in themselves, an assuredness 
that is keeping them from experiencing the freedom and fullness of what you have. If that's you, I just pray. Would you pray with me in your seat under your breath to say, Lord Jesus, here is all of me. Would you forgive my past? Forgive my choices. Set me free from sin and death. Would you make me new from the inside out? Would you lead me, teach me to trust you with everything in my life? God, I pray for those of us who know we belong to you. But we come to you to ask for miracles before a request or at the end. And we just try to take over in the middle. Open our eyes to worship the God of the mundane moments, to worship the God of provision, of opportunities. Thank you for your love for us. If that's your remembrance and proclamation this morning, I want to invite you to take the bread and to drink the juice. And to not leave here saying, man, I wish I could change, but I just don't know how. That's our joy and privilege to do together as a local church. But we just don't know where you are unless you tell us. So let us help you learn to love Jesus. The altar's open, and so are the signups. Now go and make disciples of all nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey everything that he has commanded you, full of the love of God, grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and fellowship of the Spirit. Amen. Amen. Love you guys. Have a wonderful Sunday. We'll see you next week.